welcome to the, this, this podcast on QSAR or quantitative structure activity relationships, uh, a part of the medicinal chemistry program, the NCSSM online uh, series of courses. This is part A of QSAR. In this part, we'll talk about some of the general uh, principles of QSAR. And then in part B, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the technical specifics of QSAR. So let's go ahead and get started. The main question you should have should be, why do we do QSAR? Why do we do quantitative structure activity relationships? Here's a, a good example. If you take a look at the molecule over on the right-hand side, you should notice there there's a benzene ring and we have a carboxylic acid attached to them. It's missing the H there. It should be there. And what you should notice is we have a, uh, an X there, which means a some sort of substituted functional group or other piece of, of uh, chemical. And the question is, how many different combinations might we be able to put on that particular molecule? Well, let's assume we have 10 different groups that we're putting on that benzene ring, so 10 different uh, types of, of compounds that could represent X. And we can put all of those X's, say, at uh, four different locations, carbons one, two, three, and four. And the answer would be there's about 10,000 different combinations of drugs that we could, or compounds that could come out of, of this very small um, example. That's an awful lot of compounds that we would have to make or synthesize in the lab and then test on animals or other organisms. Uh, so this is going to be why we want to do QSAR. So basically the question is, how do we find a needle in a haystack? Okay, And the traditional method has been to synthesize or to actually make in the laboratory all and test all these possible combinations. That's how we've been doing this for, for years. Um, the new approach has, is uh, that we would synthesize a small number of these compounds. We would measure various descriptors about those small number of, of compounds. We would measure their biological activity. So in other words, we would actually test those small number of compounds in an organism like a mouse or a rat. And then what we do, and this is where QSAR comes in, we predict mathematically the rest, the other, uh, all the other compounds to see which ones have the likelihood of doing what it is we want them to do. Okay, so in QSNR and drug design, so there we have some sample drugs. Uh, these compounds will have some biological activity, so we synthesize and we test uh, some number of these compounds, and we stick the results into a computer. And what we can now do is we can now computationally or mathematically predict uh, new compounds and hopefully with some improved biological activity. So this is a cartoon graphic of, of QSAR and its relationship to drug design. Uh, continuing on, why QSAR, and sometimes, by the way, we will call it QSPR, quantitative structure property relationships. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, in drug design, it cost approximately $600 million to bring a new drug to market. And that $600 million number is probably low now. This slide is probably a couple years old, and that number is probably considerably higher than $600 million. Um, one of the problems in drug design is patent life is limited. It's limited to about seven years. So after seven years, the company can no longer collect revenues off of selling that drug because other companies are now free to make generic versions of that drug. So uh, it's really important that companies not spend a lot of, uh, waste a lot of money in drug design and development, which is why QSAR is going to help us. Okay. Um, and obviously what companies do is they wait until as late as possible to file their patents. Uh, so they, that seven year period starts as late as possible. Um, bottom line is the synthesis or the making of these compounds in the lab and the purification of the compounds is really expensive and really time consuming. Uh, and we want to be able to zero in on the best candidates as quickly as we can. So uh, QSAR provides us with a method of focusing on the group of the most promising drug candidates. And that's what we really want to be able to do. And now we're only going to spend time on those compounds that are more likely to go forward in the drug design process. So QSIR is a screening mechanism that lets us make some early decisions about which compounds 
might have potential or show promise as a drug candidate that's going to actually make it to the market. Um, this slide here talks a little bit, uh, again, talks a little bit about how chemistry is done today, and this is a little bit different view. So at the top of the uh, slide here, you see desired properties, um, and the desired properties might be something like biological activity, and that's certainly true in our case, meaning pharmaceuticals. Uh, we may want to have a compound that um, has a specific characteristic or property in terms of what it does in the environment, uh, but basically, uh, you have to find these properties, and this is a version of structure property activities. So you've got a desired property, you've got to uh, come up with a structural design, and then you have to actually synthesize the compound and then measure whether or not it has the desired properties. So this is a pretty time intensive, labor intensive process. And what we want to do is the old way is to synthesize, we make the drug, we measure it, we repeat, this over and over again. That costs a lot of time and money and involves a lot of trial and error. And the new way is that we want to computationally build these molecules, molecules, calculate them computationally and repeat that, which involves a significant savings of time and money. And it's easier to do these steps, uh, many steps computationally rather than experimentally in the laboratory. We still need to do the lab work, but we can save an awful lot of time and money by doing some of the preliminary work computationally. Okay, some of the new tools, instead of trial and error, we use a computer to help, and the models relate properties of interest to structure. You've already done a fair amount of this in this course. You've already spent some considerable time uh, looking at models, looking at characteristics, looking at properties, and thinking about and discussing in your memos how these, how the structure influences those properties and vice versa. And new structures can be designed computationally, and then we just synthesize in the lab only those with an increased probability of exhibiting whatever the desired properties might be. To do all of this, we need to find a mathematical relationship between the structures and the properties that we're interested in. And that's fundamentally what QSAR is. It's a quantitative or mathematical relationship between a, the structure of the molecule, meaning what functional groups and other structures does it have, and the property of interest. In our case, in medicinal chemistry, this property would be a medicinal property or a pharmaceutical property, something that's going to make the patient get better from whatever disease he or she might have. Okay, And once we have this mathematical relationship, we can test new structures and eliminate those compounds that we think mathematically or theoretically don't stand a chance of doing biologically what we want them to be able to do. And now that allows us to focus our experimental work uh, so chemists in the lab, actually in, on the bench, can be more productive. They're going to synthesize those compounds that we think have a pretty good chance of doing what uh, we want them to do rather than just sort of shooting in the dark and making lots of compounds and, and killing lots of rats and mice to be able to get these things tested. A uh, little bit of history of QSAR. The first application was... Uh, this is uh, Corey Hanch in 1969, and he generated a mathematical equation that the biological activity he was interested in is what's the minimum effective dose needed to effect a, a cure on a particular patient, okay? And he came up with a number of descriptors. Okay? Most of these were electronic or computational quantum chemical characteristics. Some of you have more experience with that than others. And some of those were things like hydrophobicity. All of you in this course are, I hope, beginning to understand uh, this concept of hydrophobic or hydrophilic, or lipophobic or lipophilic, and get it, beginning to get a sense of these descriptors. Okay. And the equation that he came up with here is this very complicated looking mathematical equation which basically is just a version of, of, of y equals mx plus b. And so y in this case is the logarithm of 1 over c, and c is the minimum effective dose, and p in this case is, you're familiar with p, and this is the partition coefficient, and you're familiar with this as log p, okay? So you see log p in there. And this sigma thing, this little Greek symbol, uh, symbol sigma, 
is what you'll spend some time learning in this particular week's activity. This is the Hammett substituent constant. You've already had a little experience with this. We just haven't called it the Hammett constant yet. And the k values, k1, 2, 3, and 4, are basically uh, uh, constants that are derived from the regression analysis. So these are, if you were doing y equals mx plus b, uh, uh, m is slope, b is the y-intercept, and those would be our k constants in this particular equation. So look at k4, that would be analogous to b in the y equals mx plus b equation. Okay. So this is basically a more complicated version of uh, y equals mx plus b. Okay, some quick definitions. QSAR uh, relates molecular structure to pharmacological activity. QSPR uh, relates structure to physical properties such as boiling point and dipole moments. Okay, so lots of ge general campus use QSPR. Uh, QSAR is very much, uh, the A really does stand for biological or pharmacological activity. Okay. Uh, Terms are often used interchangeably. Uh, more often than not, you'll hear QSAR and QSPR used interchangeably. Uh, the other term you'll hear sometimes applied is this thing called cheminformatics, which includes the design, creation, organization, management, retrieval, analysis, dissemination, visualization, and use of chemical information. So basically anything that's computational chemistry uh, is also known as cheminformatics, and oftentimes these terms are used uh, interchangeably. Some scientists don't, many people do, uh, but these are terms that you're going to hear uh, a great deal, we hope, in the uh, remainder of your professional days. Okay, the goals of QSAR, QSPR, as, as we said before, is to find a quantitative relationship between the structure of the molecule and some observed activity or property. Okay, in these chart that you see over here on the right, You've seen something like this before. You've been doing, actually, you've been doing QSAR now for a couple of weeks. We just haven't called it that. Okay. And this is an empirical uh, science, meaning this is data driven. You have to generate data, you have to analyze data. And if you recall, if you've been paying attention, we've been using the software package R to help us do this semi this empirical analysis. Okay. And uh, QSAR often involves what's called multivariant statistical predictions. That sounds very intimidating, but multivariant just means more than one variable. So if you have y equals mx plus b, that's a single variant statistical equation where the variable is x. Uh, most of the QSAR stuff will involve more than one variable. You'll have x1, x2, x3, so on and so forth. And the hope, what we try to hope is we find a good statistical correlation between some biological or pharmacological activity and its molecular property. So we want a good R squared value somewhere close to one. If you see the graphic here, the R squared is about 84% or 0.84. That's a pretty good value. And you see the data uh, fits the line pretty well. This isn't a straight line. This is a uh, polynomial fit. So the line is curved, but the data fits pretty well there. And we would say this is a good statistical correlation. Okay, some of the steps on how to do this. You, you compile a list of compounds with experimentally determined properties. Okay, so you have a list of test compounds and you know their experimentally determined properties. And ideally, you want 10 times the number of compounds as you have parameters or variables. So, for example, if you have one variable like x, maybe that x is log p, okay, you want 10 compounds that you know the log p value for. If you have two variables, you want 20 compounds, three variables, 30 compounds, and we'll get a chance to explore that a little bit uh, this week in the lab and other places. Okay, so you obtain the geometries, you compute the molecular descriptors, in other words, you run some computational chemistry calculations like electrostatic potential that you did on the last lab. You calculate the correlation coefficients, uh, you perform a curve fit or linear regression, and you try to improve your fit by including or excluding some of these parameters. You've already had a chance to do this a little bit. Again, you've done a couple QSAR activities already, um, but this is a uh, uh, more detailed focus on being able to do that. Okay, um, and here's a. This is a very good graphic. It looks very intimidating, very uh, very busy, uh, 
but basically this is a procedural diagram for how one does QSAR. So, for example, you can calculate what's called physical property space. You can calculate things like log P and dipole moment and boiling points and Hammett constants, uh, homo-lumo gaps, solubility. Those should sound familiar. You should uh, recognize that these are things that you've been doing all along. And we do these either experimentally or computationally. And then with QSAR, we try to relate those physical properties with some biological activity or chemical property or catalytic activity or toxicity or physical property. And once we have these relationships, uh, we can then at the bottom of the screen there see where we can predict new compounds with predicted properties. Over on the right-hand side, you see something called mathematical property space. You'll be glad to know we're not going to talk about this, that this is basically topological chemistry and connectivity chemistry. Um, which is stuff that we get from structural information, and we're not going to spend any time in this course on uh, uh, doing QSAR, topological QSAR. So I think you'll be pleased that we're going to leave that side of, the, of this diagram out. But that's a big part of uh, QSAR, and it all comes from an area down the bottom right that you see called combinatorial chemistry. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, much later in the course if we have time. Okay, and all this predicts the activity or property that we're particularly interested in looking at. Okay, some of the pros and cons of this. The pros is we really don't have to understand what is happening in the chemical reaction. We don't need what's called a detailed mechanistic understanding. Okay, it's all done mathematically. It's a fast and easy way to screen a large number of drugs. And from our screening, we can figure out which ones have a likelihood of doing what we want them to do biologically. Okay. We can provide answers to what type of molecular structures we will now take into the lab, actually synthesize and test using our animal models, mice, rats, cats, dogs, etc. Okay? And the cons is it's, it's less insightful than a mechanistic model. We really don't understand what's happening chemically. We just know that the numbers are saying we predict that this drug should do what we want it to do. We don't know why, uh, but uh, for a large for some extent and purposes, we don't care. We just know the math says that this drug is going to do good things, and we're going to test it, and we're going to see if it does what we think it's going to do. Um, if the mechanism were known, then we could understand better, better candidates. We'll talk a little bit about mechanisms later in the course, uh, but we're not quite ready for that quite yet. Okay, And we do need some experimental data. You've had a couple labs now where we, I've given you some experimental data. And you've used that to generate a y equals mx plus b uh, regression line equation. And you've used that regression equation to then predict some characteristics and properties of some, exper of some uh, fictional drugs. Okay? So you've been doing this, again, all along. Okay? Some examples from the literature. Uh, this is the one we sort of did in the last lab, although we didn't use atomic charges. We used electrostatic potential. So in the last lab, you predicted pKa's from... Uh, looking at acidic hydrogens, um, we can predict things like electrophilic aromatic substitutions from something called activation hardness. I don't expect you to know a lot of these terms. Uh, we can predict a log P, otherwise known as an octanol water partition coefficient. We can predict these from atomic charge densities. Uh, we can predict things like acidity uh, from, some of you will recognize the AM1 there, from atomic charges on oxygen atoms. Uh, we can predict the, how uh, quinolins mutate DNA in cells from lowest un unoccupied molecular orbital energies. Uh, we can predict uh, what's called how uh, a machine called a gas chromatograph will retain uh, substances from multiple quantum mechanical descriptors. So there's lots of examples from the literature where we can use QSAR to help us mathematically predict the behavior of chemical molecules. In our case, we're interested in predicting the behavior of molecules that are serving as 